So now I want to take a little time to talk about what's referred to as complex splitting. This is a concept that a lot of students don't get a great handle on uh, in their undergraduate course. So complex splitting occurs when there are multiple non-equivalent neighboring hydrogens. So first thing we're going to look at, we're going to look at this hydrogen in red here. So, and it turns out he's got two neighbors. He's got this neighbor right here and this neighbor right here. And notice these two hydrogens, even though they're attached to the same carbon, are not equivalent. Double bonds are not free to rotate, and there's no symmetry in this case. That symmetry in the molecule does not exist. The chlorine versus the hydrogen on the right side throws it off. So these two hydrogens are not equivalent, but they're both on the adjacent carbon relative to this hydrogen. So they're both the hydrogen, uh, the red labeled hydrogen neighbor. And so in this case, he's got two different neighbors that are non-equivalent, and we're going to see complex splitting. Now it turns out uh, the splitting that occurs often has what's called a J coupling constant associated with it, and actually how far apart those peaks are uh, when they're split uh, is going to be different. We can we often report these in different uh, measurements of Hertz, uh, and you can tell the difference between cis and trans and geminal and things of a sort. So that's another. Uh, piece of trivia to file away is that you can tell the difference between cis, trans, and geminal uh, using HNMR. Uh, but in this case, so if I look at, uh, we'll call this, let's say, eh, let's just look at the relationship between these two. They are cis to each other. So, and being cis to each other, we expect the J value to be somewhere in the 6 to 12 hertz range. I'm just going to say, let's just say it happens to be 8 hertz for the fun of it. Uh, and then we're going to look at the relationship between these two hydrons. So, and they're trans to each other. And we see the trans is in the 12 to 18 range. I'm just going to say, let's say it's somewhere around 16 hertz. So, and then we want to construct what's called a splitting tree to figure out what this signal would look like. Uh, but uh, essentially what you're doing is you're going to look at each of these neighboring hydrons separately, and you're going to apply an n plus 1 rule to each. And so for this one hydrogen neighbor up top, the neighbors plus 1 rule would lead to two peaks. So and for this one down below, the neighbors plus 1 rule would lead to two peaks. And what you're going to do is actually multiply those two together. So two peaks times two peaks actually equals four peaks. And we'll find out we're going to get what's called a doublet of doublets, uh, which if you kind of listen to the name implies four peaks. Uh, Typically, uh, I highly recommend you look at your bigger splitting first, and that our case was the 16 hertz. So what we're going to do is we have a signal for our red hydrogen. So, and that signal is going to get split into two peaks by the trans hydrogen. And those two peaks are going to be separated by a distance of 16 hertz. So we get these two peaks, and they're split by a difference of 16 hertz. So, and then each of those two peaks is going to get split by our cis hydrogen, so, but only by a splitting of 8 hertz. So we're going to split this apart now, but only by half as much, to getting two additional peaks here. And so this splitting right here is only 8 hertz. And we'll do the same thing over on this side. So in the four solid lines we've drawn at the bottom here, that's where you'd see your peaks. And so your typical signal might look something like this in the HNMR spectrum. So, and we'd call this again a doublet of doublets. So, and we can distinguish this from a quartet. If you notice, all four of these would be equal in height, whereas a quartet, you generally have some crescendoing, which I'll call, towards the center. So kind of following Pascal's triangle and stuff. We don't have that in this doublet of doublets. All four of these signals would be exactly the same intensity. Uh, so this is your first example of complex splitting. Let's look at some more complicated ones. So this is the second example of complex splitting, and we're going to look at the splitting pattern for this hydrogen indicated in red again. So, and on the adjacent carbon to his left, he's got this hydrogen neighbor, and to the adjacent carbon down to the lower right, he's got these three hydrogen neighbors. And so as a result, he ends up having four total neighbors, but we can't look at them that way because these two sets of neighbors are not equivalent, and therefore complex splitting is going to occur. Now, the relationship here is one that is cis, so, and again, that might be in the uh, 6 to 12 hertz range. And I'm going to, again, I'm going to say this maybe is 6 hertz. Cool. And then the relationship between the hydrogen and these three hydrogens. So it's not cis, trans, or geminal. In fact, it's not even on here. So in this case, we have an sp2 hydrogen with a bunch of sp3 hydrogens. And it's probably going to be higher than the 7 hertz term here. But I don't have an exact number for you. I'm just going to say that maybe it's 10 hertz. So, and we're going to construct a splitting tree based on those numbers. 
And so in this case, I highly recommend you, you start with the larger splitting first. We're going to start with the 10 hertz. And if we do the n plus 1 rule here, uh, we get four peaks because there's three neighboring hydrants. Plus 1 gets you four peaks. So, and so if we split a signal into four peaks that are separated by 10 hertz, we'd end up with something looking like maybe this. So, and this distance apart right here would be 10 hertz, as would be this distance and this distance apart here. So then we're going to take this further and take a look at the other neighbor. And this other neighbor, the splitting of 6 hertz, and again, it's just one neighbor. So if we could apply the n plus 1 rule, that'd be two peaks. And so we're going to split each of these apart into two peaks. And the total distance apart is going to be 6 hertz. So 3 hertz to the left, 3 hertz to the right, and you get two new signals. 3 hertz to the left. 3 hertz to the right, and you get two new signals. 3 hertz to the left, and 3 hertz to the right, and you get two new signals. And 3 hertz to the left, 3 hertz to the right, and you get two new signals. So again, this distance right here is a total of 6 hertz. Same here, same here, same here. So, but you can see in this case, our spectrum might look something like Something like this. So and these, again, would all be equal in height. And I know that's ugly. My apologies. But they'd be roughly equal in height here, but we'd see eight peaks. And so in this case, we might call this a quartet of doublets or something like that. And some people might just be like, you know what? That's too many peaks. And they might just use the term multiplet. When you get a lot of peaks with complex splitting, splitting, especially if they're not all resolvable, if you start seeing some overlap and stuff like that, people will start using the word multiplet. So technically, multiplet doesn't just mean a lot of peaks. Uh, it means a lot of peaks that aren't all necessarily distinguishable with complex splitting. So using the word multiplet definitely implies complex splitting. Uh, in this case, uh, whether you see the word quartet of doublets or not, you should recognize it's eight peaks. But if you were told in a spectrum a quartet of doublets and had to go backwards, you'd have to realize, okay, quartet of doublets, deal with the quartet part, be like n plus 1 equals 4, that would imply three neighbors. And then the doublets part, n plus 1 equals 2, and that would imply one neighbor. And so you'd have a hydrant that has three neighbors on one side and one neighbor on the other side. You could kind of go backwards interpreting the quartet of doublets to figure out how many neighbors it's got uh, and how many different sets of neighbors and things of this sort. Um, but this is complex splitting. Oh, so much fun. Uh, let's take a look at one more example. So I saved this last example of complex splitting uh, because sometimes we don't even notice that complex splitting has occurred. But again, anytime there's multiple sets of non-equivalent neighbors, complex splitting is actually taking place. So we're going to look at the signal for these two hydrants. So, and first off, there's two different sets of neighbors. There's these three equivalent hydrants as one set of neighbors, and then these two hydrants are on the adjacent carbon on the other side. And so we see two non-equivalent sets of neighbors, and complex splitting is going to take place. Now, we should apply an n plus 1 rule to both sides. So on this side, n plus 1, so three neighbors plus 1 gets us four peaks. And on this side, n plus 1, so two neighbors plus 1 gets us three peaks. And 4 times 3 is going to be 12 peaks. So, and the key is sometimes these peaks are overlapping and things of a sort and things get a little complicated. Uh, but what we're going to see here is if I told you the J value was just like we see in this relationship right here, so let's just say 7 hertz, and I told you that the relationship with these guys was also with a coupling constant of 7 hertz, uh, we're going to see something interesting taking place when we set up the splitting tree. Uh, and in this case, with them both being 7 hertz, it doesn't really technically matter which one you start with. I'm just going to start with the one with greater multiplicity, so the 4. Uh, but I'm going to split our single signal up into 1, 2, 3, and 4. And again, this difference right here is going to be 7 hertz between all sets of peaks here. Uh, okay. So then we're going to take each of these three and split them into three peaks each that are also going to be 7 hertz apart. So in this case, I'll go off this way and off this way so and come up with three peaks in this case that are also, again, still 7 hertz apart. Cool. I'll do the same thing with this guy. And if you notice, going 7 hertz off to the left, 
overlaps with this guy, coming straight down overlaps with this guy, and then coming 7 hertz off to the right, it's going to overlap with this guy, as we'll see in a minute. So that's his 3. So, and then for this guy, straight down is there, 7 hertz off to the left is there, 7 hertz off to the right is there, and then finally for this guy, 7 hertz off to the left is here, straight down is here, and 7 hertz off to the right is here. And so these would not be equally tall. Some of these that have the most overlapping would be the taller signals and stuff like that. But instead of seeing 12 signals, we're only going to see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 signals. And if we actually look at it and take in the relative heights and stuff like that, you might see something looking like... this. And it ends up looking a whole lot like a sextet. So, or we could just simply call it a multiplet, which is probably the truer statement, but this multiplet ends up looking peculiarly like a sextet. Uh, oftentimes when you've got all alkane hydrogens, uh, J coupling values end up being the same. So even with multiple non-equivalent neighbors, you might be able to just treat them as one big neighbor pool, and that's often what it ends up looking like. So here if we look, we got three neighbors there, two neighbors there. If we just pulled them into one big large group of neighbors of five neighbors and said five plus one is six peaks, we get a sextet, and that's what we end up actually seeing in our spectrum. But again, technically, it's not really a sextet. It just resembles one. It's really a multiplet. There's really complex splitting going on. Uh, but this is what happens when you have equal J-coupling values between non-equivalent sets of neighbors.